Praise the Lord. Be seated. Amen. Well, when I think about those two songs, when we're doing praise and worship, do you ever just think about the words? Think about what's being sung, right? The goodness of God, the mercy of God. I couldn't help but think about the passage in Lamentations that says, His mercies are new every morning. Isn't that wonderful? That every morning there's fresh grace, fresh mercy from the throne room of heaven. And all we have to do is receive it by faith. Isn't that wonderful? So this morning, his mercies are new. I don't care what you did last night. Amen. Now, there is repentance, of course, but (laughs) his mercy is new every morning. Thank God for that, the goodness of God. I'm glad you're here if you're joining us by Facebook or YouTube. Glad you're with us. Uh, Hey, I'll tell you, this is fresh to me. I haven't been in this pulpit in about two weeks, so it's good to be here. But I want to thank Silas and Pastor Silas and Joe and uh, John Cox. Boy, he preached a good word a few Wednesday nights ago, and uh, they all did a wonderful job. And uh, none of them are here, so I can't congratulate and honor them in front of you, but I do it, and they're probably watching, so on vacation. So uh, thank you so much. And then last Sunday, of course, Johnny Sawyer. Did he not preach a powerful word here? Amen. Well, I knew you would enjoy it, and uh, thank God for that. So thanks to all those brethren. Come in this morning to a surprise. This podium is back on the stage. Isn't that wonderful? This thing weighs about 300 pounds. A couple of months ago, I was convinced that this podium was causing some of our mic issues. Broke my heart because this is my favorite one. Uh, So I dragged this thing off the stage. Guess what I still had? Mic issues. So I said, I'm not dragging that thing back. Forget it. And I find out, Clyde, stand up, buddy. I want everybody to see how muscular you are and strong. He moved this thing here by himself because he knew his preacher wanted this podium here. Thank God for him. (laughs) <laughs> Amen. So you thank him, and I thank him today, and I wish I had a hundred of him in this congregation, because he's a worker, and he works for the kingdom of God. So thank you, brother. Love you so much. Amen. Oh, I know it. Hey, this is, this is pure granite right here in the middle. I, long story behind this podium. I'm not going to go into it now, but I will sometime. Long story behind it. Podiums mean something to me. I don't just look at this as a place to lay my Bible. This is sacred to me. Uh, I think about Ezra in the book of Nehemiah when he would stand behind the podium and stand on the podium and declare the word for days at a time. But people knew to look to the podium, the Bible says, the pulpit, that's where the word comes from, to hear the word of God. So, uh, but this one means a lot to me and I'm glad it's here. So thank you, brother. Amen. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, if you have your Bible, turn there and thank you for being here. I know we've got several on vacation and it's Boy, it's just a hot summer day here in North Carolina, isn't it? I want to have prayer. As you're turning, I want to have prayer for Sister uh, Sherry Snyder and Joe and uh, Tony and Lisa. Tony and Sherry are brother and sister, as many of you know. Their mother passed away this morning about 12.41 a.m., somewhere around that time frame. So we're going we're gonna to have special prayer for them today. Uh, uh, she's been in the nursing home for years now, but... Uh, it just sort of, she declined this week, and, uh, but she's in glory, praise God. So Amen. let's pray for them today. Can we do that and remember them in prayer and uh, give God glory uh, for his goodness and his mercy? Because to be absent from the body is to what? Be present with the Lord. I thank God for that promise that we all have. Amen. Daniel 12, we're going to start at verse 1. I'm going to do an exposition. My topic, of course, as you can see, is knowledge without truth. And I can't even see those words under there. A sign of the last days, I believe is what it says. Uh, so this is my, my topic. We're going to dive into that a little more. And I believe Daniel hits us right where we're living today. Let's pray. Father, today we give you praise. Today we honor you. And we give you glory. Lord, without you, we would be nothing. Without you, there is no hope. But today we have hope. We have hope beyond the scope of impossibility. We have a hope that says we can trust you even when we don't understand. When we're walking through the wilderness, walking through dry places, 
we can trust that your word is true to the glory of God. We may not understand, we may not see what we're believing to see at the moment, we may not see the fruition of our prayers being answered at the moment, but Lord, we know that in the wilderness you provide the whole time. Hallelujah. Everything we have need of, you will provide, and we give you glory for it. In the name of Jesus, we give you glory. This morning, Father, we lift up Sherry Snyder and Tony Wilson, their families. Lord, their mother is with you today, and I thank you for that promise, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with you. But I pray that during this difficult time that you would bring peace that passes all understanding to this dear family, who means so much to me and so much to this church. And I pray you would comfort them, Lord, body, soul, and spirit. Bring rest, bring peace that passes all understanding that will help keep their heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Lord, I lift up all those who are vacating and or at the beach and wherever they may be. I pray you'd lay your hand upon them, keep them safe, let them enjoy their time in the name of Jesus. We pray, touch us this morning as we go into your word, as we proceed in honoring you today. In Jesus' name, everybody shout amen. amen. Praise God. Well, all the guys that covered for me, they're gone. I guess they had enough of you. I don't know. So, no, teasing. But I thank them, and I thank you this morning. I love you. Appreciate you for all you do. Daniel chapter 12, let's look. I was reading this uh, the other day, matter of fact, we were up in the mountains in Gatlinburg, uh, running away from bears and coyotes and all those things, you know. Uh, that uh, Did they take my picture? I don't know. We took theirs. But, but it, was, uh, it was truly a uh, good time. But I read this passage while I was there. Daniel chapter 12, look at verse 1. Daniel, of course, I'm going to start reading, I promise. Daniel, of course is a prophet of the last days. Daniel gives us world history at a glance. He and John the Revelator mesh up so well together. And here's what he gives us about the day in which we're living. Everybody shout today. Very interesting. And at that time, verse 1 of chapter 12, shall Michael stand up. Now, Michael, who's Michael? Michael is the archangel. Michael is the fighting, warring angel. We see that he takes Lucifer and throws him out of heaven before, back eons, before God said, let there be light. Jesus said, I beheld him fall like lightning from the third heaven to where he is now, and that is the second heaven. The second heaven, the firmament, the spirit world, where angelic beings are all around us even now, where demonic spirits are all around who oppress and depress and try to possess, cause havoc, cause problems. That's why we wrestle against spiritual warfare. That's where he is. That's where he is. Michael will also, in Revelation chapter 12, take Satan during the time of tribulation, the seven years of tribulation that will come upon this earth, what initiates that is the rapture of the church, the catching away of the saints, the resurrection of the righteous dead. At that moment, there will begin a tribulation period that the world has never seen. During that time, about midpoint, Satan will be cast out of the second heaven. He said, John the Revelator says, I saw him kicked out of heaven into the earth to embody the beast, the Antichrist of Revelation 13. So Michael not only kicked him out the first time, out of the third heaven, but he's also going to throw him out of the second heaven. <laughs> Michael is a warring angel. Daniel sees Michael. And the great prince which stands before the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Now, notice and highlight, he says, there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. We think there's trouble now. This doesn't compare anything to what will be happening during this time of tribulation. But here's the good news. 
If you place faith in Jesus Christ today, don't wait another second. You can be assured that you will be part of the ones who are delivered. Do you see it in that passage? Delivered from the trouble that shall be upon this earth. This is Jew and Gentile alike. All who will say yes to Jesus Christ have an assurance of being delivered. And can I tell you with everything in my heart today that that could happen today. It could happen before. I hope it does. I pray it happens before we leave this building. That's why there's never a better moment to surrender your life completely and totally to Jesus Christ. Where there is fruit unto righteousness. Fully surrendering to Christ. Because there's coming a time like never before. And it's upon us. Everyone that shall be found, who's delivered? Here they are. Everyone that is found written in the book. What book is that? That's the book. He's going to open one day the Lamb's book of life and see whose name is pinned there. Erased off the corners of hell, pinned into the Lamb's book of life to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. We're going to get into that in just a moment. And many of them that sleep, verse 2, in the dust of the earth, that's those who have died, shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's why what I'm doing right now is one of the heaviest things a person on this planet can do. Because based upon what I say to you today, it could mean eternal life or eternal damnation to somebody listening. That's how important this is. This isn't just a place to get encouragement. This is a place to understand what the Scripture says about the day in which we are living. And the day in which we are living, we are coming up upon the day of the Lord. The return of Christ when we will see this time of trouble like the world has never known. Amen. But you can be delivered from it. You can have your name pinned into the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah. Some are going to awake and resurrect to everlasting life, a new body. And then some are going to resurrect to see damnation, only to die again. Now these two resurrections take place at different times. The first one will take place when the rapture happens. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now that's the righteous dead. Those who are resurrecting to damnation will be resurrected after the thousand-year reign of Christ. We call it the millennial reign, which takes place after the seven years of tribulation. After that thousand-year reign of which you and I as believers, prayerfully, will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years upon this earth, after that culmination of a thousand years, the Bible says Satan is loosed for a season from the bottomless pit where he has been chained for a thousand years, he will be loosed, gather an army, go against Christ and his people once again. Imagine that. Only to lose once again, cast into the lake of fire forever. Amen. And that, that point, in fact, go with me to Revelation. See if I can find it. Revelation chapter 21, I believe. I'll read it to you. Revelation, yes, Revelation 21 verse 11. Now let's look at that. Revelation 21, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it. This is referred to as the great white throne judgment. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there were found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books... Everybody say books. It's not just one book. There'll be many books, evidently. Well, what does that mean, Pastor? Well, here's what I think it means. Simply, Jesus said you will give an account for every idle word that you speak. Jesus said you would give an account for every action 
that was manifested in your life upon this earth. Now, once again, this is the unbelieving dead. These are those who never fully surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. These are those who sat on church pews for years, thought they were saved, but did not live a committed life to the Lord Jesus. They will stand before God, He will open the books, and they will be judged by what they said and what they did. But here's the good news for us. Those who say yes to Jesus, we will be judged for, eternity, for our eternal life based upon what Christ did, not what we've done. Now, I don't know about you, but that's good news to me, that when I stand before him, the only thing I'll be judged for are my works of service to him and be rewarded accordingly. But when it comes to my salvation, my eternal security, that lies in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So if I put my faith in him, I don't have to stand at this judgment seat here at the great white throne judgment and give an account for every idle word, every action, every sin that I've committed because I will bear the responsibility for it. That's what the cross is all about. Jesus took our sin, judgment, and punishment for us. So when we put faith in him, we can be assured that the books will not be opened. Only the book, the Lamb's book of life. The dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. I believe he says the sea because every person who's died of shipwreck, every person who have been consumed by sharks and fish and all that. You'd say, well, how are they going to resurrect? Well, I want to tell you something. The God, the creator of heaven and earth, knows where every cell of every human being since Adam, where it is. And not only does he know where it is, but he has the power to bring it back together again. Hallelujah to God. So they gave up the dead. And they were judged every man according to their works, verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, this is truth. This will happen. Go back to Daniel with that in mind. And I want to read one more verse to you. And this is what I want to concentrate on, knowledge without truth. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Notice, in, as you're turning, notice in the passage I just read to you out of Revelation that it refers to this as the second death. So if you're not born again, you're going to die twice. The physical death, for it is appointed unto every man to die, then the judgment. And then there's the judgment when you stand before God, the great white throne judgment. If you are not found in him when you die. That's the second death. And you will die for eternity in the lake of fire. And you will be forever dying, yet you'll be living. For eternity. Now, many believe that it's annihilation, that when, when you go to the lake of fire, that's it. You're annihilated. There's no memory of you. You're, you don't suffer. It's just your, your life's over. But Jesus said hell was a place where the worm dies not. The soulish man, the emotions, the will, the intellect will never fade away. You will live and understand for eternity where you are. Now, what do you hate? To, to understand and think that you were cast into the lake of fire forever. Forever. All because you did not fully surrender your life to Christ. Jesus loves you. He loved you enough to live for you, die for you, resurrect for you. He loves you enough to give you his truth today. And hey, listen to what Jesus said. Because, you know, a lot of times, people like to talk about the love of God and operate in love. Jesus operated in love. 
Listen to something he said. He said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I've come to divide husband and wife. I've come to divide child from their parent, brother from their sister. What was he meaning? His meaning was that Christ, the Lord God Jehovah, is the number one priority in your life. Now, as a pastor, you see situations like this where, let's say homosexuality. Let's say it comes into your family, and then you change your position on it, because you do have to love them. You do have to invite them for dinner, or do you? Is that what Jesus meant when he said that? Do you give in to the convictions of his word just because it comes close to you? No. He was saying so strongly that I come first. Now that's difficult. That's difficult. But God loves you enough to call you out, set you apart, and pin your name into the Lamb's book of life. But his love will never override your choice. Never. You must choose him above everything else. Now that's hard, but it's the truth. And that's what I'm here to give you. Look at verse of Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro. This is what I want you to get. And knowledge, everybody shout knowledge, knowledge. shall be increased. Now, I'm going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 in just a moment. I want you to think about something. Daniel in this passage is saying that in the last days, the time I'm telling you about, the time which we're living in right now, He said knowledge would be expanded. And we're living in a time where information is available like never before. If my children want to know an answer to something, you know what they do? Hey, Google. There it is. We live in a society where information and knowledge is overflowing to us. Through media, politics, health, COVID-19, the vaccine, all this information, and you've got it coming from every side. But I fear that there's very little truth in all of it. We see this candidate, we see that candidate, one saying this, the other saying that, but is there any truth in any of it? We hear about COVID-19, it's coming back evidently. We hear about the vaccine. Is it safe? Is it not? Who knows? Because we have knowledge without the truth. And that is a sign that we are living in the last days. And that's what Daniel's saying here. But here's how it's impacted and affected the church. With knowledge, people lose the sense of truth and reality. Let me explain. We live in a society that has been created to be effortless. You don't have to put effort into anything anymore. If you want to know something, you don't have to go to the library and research it. Just look it up on that cell phone. Boom, there it is. What must be true, there it is. If I want to watch TV, I don't even have to pick up a remote anymore. I can say, hey, TV, turn on. And I know we're laughing, but we are living in an effortless society. So much so that a generation doesn't want to go to work. Why? Because they've been trained to not put effort into anything. Their brains have been reconditioned to have instant gratification. I'm bored. Boop, here we go. So now... You put effort into nothing. And I'm including myself here. 
How does that impact the church? Well, here's how it impacts. It's just so much easier to watch it online. And I'm guilty. Guilty of it. It's so much easier to do prayer meeting from home than to driving here and driving back. You know what I'm talking about. You think about that stuff all the time. Don't, don't say you don't. And it's impacted all of us, including myself. But it's created an effortless society. So anything that takes effort, anything that takes sacrifice, anything that takes service, anything that might put you in a bind, you opt out of it most of the time. Because that's how we've been conditioned. We have a plethora of knowledge, but we're not grasping the truth. We cannot let that happen to us as the body of Christ. The reason I say that, I was at a seminar last Saturday at the state office. I was teaching a seminar to a bunch of pastors who are struggling. Their churches are dying. They're... I said, I don't know why you want me there. But they wanted me there to talk to these guys. And here was th- one of the things that came up. What about virtual church? I'm thinking about just canceling all the services and going to one service a month on Sunday morning. The rest of them were doing it online. Effortless society. You want to cater to dysfunction. That's what I told the guy. You want to cater to dysfunction just because it's more palatable for them? Christ has called us out. What if they take that away? What if they take your service away? What will you do then after you've been conditioned to do that? Do you think you're going to make the sacrifice at that point to go to God's house? I know this is hard, but this is true. I see it. I'm telling you, and I've been preaching it for years. We got rid of Sunday night. Sunday night when I was growing up, I want to date myself. That was camp meeting service. Justin, you remember, he and I were made to go to church on Sunday night, weren't we? We'd sit there and act up, do God knows what, but we did see the Holy Ghost move. We saw the power of God. We knew it was real. We've gotten rid of that because we want to spend time with our families. And I get it. I'm not really against that, honestly. Wednesday night's becoming a thing of the past. Many churches in this state, in the church of God, are doing virtual Wednesday night service. And it'll turn into Sunday morning. I've been saying that for years. Because we're being conditioned to have knowledge without the truth. Here's the truth. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling, physical assembling of yourselves together, as so many will do at that day. What day is that? The last days. Don't do it. And I'm not against technology. I'm not against live. I'm not against any of that. I'm going to use it to magnify the Lord, build up the kingdom. The best I know how. That's what I'm going to do. But I will tell you this. Do not let yourself become effortless. Don't let yourself be lazy. And I know that's hard, but it's the truth. Make yourself be who God has called you to be. Amen. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, Paul talks about the last days. And I want to close in just a moment. I want to have prayer. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Do you know that you can have knowledge <laughs> and information but no truth? It's all over the internet. There's so much knowledge out there with very little truth. Right? So we have to make that distinction. Look at verse, verse uh, 1 of 2 Timothy 3. Paul This is the last book he wrote. It wasn't going to be very long until he would lose his life. He would lose his head at the guillotine for his faith. Weeks, months after this. Listen to what he says. This also know that in the last days perilous times shall come. 
Do you know what that means? That means there will be problems with no solutions. That's what perilous means. How many problems does this country have? How many problems does this world have? Yet there is no solution to it. No solution. That's perilous times. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Highlight that. When somebody can video record somebody being attacked and not help them, that's without natural affection. When someone is dying and you would rather put it on your Twitter page as opposed to helping someone in need, that's without natural affection. Once again, that would take effort, that would take sacrifice, and we have a generation and a people that do not want to do that. Truce breakers. <laughs> Listen, I can't get off this natural affection thing. When I was in law enforcement, I saw things that am, even today, I think about it and I'm like, how can people do that? I would see women sell their children for crack cocaine. Happens all the time. How could a mother do that to their child? Without natural affection. It's gone. Sign of the last days. Truce breakers. No commitments. False accusers. Incontinent. Fierce. False accusers. How many people have been accused online about something they were supposedly had done but did not do? And everybody has that information. But no truth behind it. Happens all the time, right? Once again, knowledge without truth. Despisers of those that are good. We see that in our government every day. If it's Christianity, if it's Christ-centered, if it has anything to do with Jesus, let's put them down, let's get rid of it, let's shame them, let's throw them out. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. There are churches all over America today, packed to the gills, but there's not a gospel presentation once. Form of godliness, denying the power thereof. Verse 7, this is what I want you to see. Ever learning... Never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So you can read, you can learn, you can collect information. But the truth never sticks in your heart. And I know I, I know I down these cell phones and technology Folks, hear me today. I'm here because I love you. I want to help you. And I would do you a disservice if I did not tell you the truth. And I want to tell you, I've decided that I'm going to stand before God. And I want to be faithful to Him and make Him happy before I make anybody in this world happy. Ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is the truth? The truth is, Jesus is coming. He could come before the next election. He could come before this night is over. But you have to ask yourself, does your life truly, and only you know this, does your life truly reflect that of someone who is born again? Someone who is saved. Does it? I'm going to close with this. Ephesians 4. 
I've got to go here. Ephesians 4, then we're going to pray and partake in communion. Ephesians 4, and I want to look at verse 1. This is the word of the Lord to you today. Ephesians 4, verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner, this is Paul again, of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. He's talking to the body of Christ. He's talking to you and I. This is instruction for you and I today. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing, everybody say that, forbearing one another in love. What does that mean? Tolerate one another. That's the best definition for that word in the Greek. Tolerate one another in the body of Christ. You're going to have disagreements. You're going to get upset. Somebody's going to hurt your feelings. It's bound to happen. Jesus said it's impossible for it not to happen. But here's what Paul is saying. Tolerate it and love one another. In other words, forgive them, move on, let's go. Endeavoring, verse 3, endeavoring means effort. Make the effort in an effortless society, the way we've been programmed and set up, consciously make the effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Oh, God, help me this morning. There's one body, one Spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. That means we all have grace to deal with things differently. Some can deal with it, some can't. Some people can take a harsh word from somebody and, or, or something that shouldn't have been said. They can forgive and move on. Some people can't. They need help. They need direction. That's why he says tolerate. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's the truth. That is the truth. Pray with me. Father, right here today, I ask you to forgive us of all of our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As we endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, I pray that we would not be a people that have knowledge but no truth. But Lord, Pilate asked you on that day, he said, what is truth? And you declared that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, you are number one. And today we surrender our lives, surrender our hearts. And Lord, I ask you to forgive us. Cleanse us this day. Make us new again. Make us a fresh, a new creation. Hallelujah. As the body of Christ, wash us, cleanse us, make us whole. Lord, I know that your mercies are new every morning. Oh, hallelujah. And that your grace is extended to us every day. And we can dwell in the house of the Lord. And that's what we want to do today is dwell in your presence and in your power. We know you're coming. Knowledge is increasing. There's a plethora of information out there. But Holy Spirit, I ask you to give us the discernment to know what is the truth and what is a lie. But even when we can't decipher, we can turn to you who is the truth, and we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. Hallelujah. Lord, there are coming times in this country. They may try to shut us down again, Lord. They may make us go live again. But Lord, I pray that any form of a coronavirus would not touch or harm your people Amen. in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm asking you to protect your people who are here today, those who are watching. I pray that you would protect the body of Christ, that we would rise up in this nation and declare that we belong to Jesus and that God, Jehovah, is our God and that we walk in the Spirit and the power of Almighty God. And Lord, let us continually endeavor together, together to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
Help us to make the effort in the name of Jesus. Help us to make the effort. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.